Therefore, it is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. In 2011, the Auditor General pointed out the government's energy policies were disastrous. But it took until last week for the Minister of Energy to actually come clean and admit it. Mr. Speaker, why did it take six years, six years for the Liberals to acknowledge the damage they've done? Well, Mr. Speaker, um, you know, I think the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition knows full well that there have been investments that have been made in the electricity system in Ontario that were absolutely necessary. A member from Renfrew and Ipissing, Pembroke, come to order. And if um, I'm going to read that as an indication of the House's demeanor today, I'll ramp it up. And without the other comments, please. Thank you. With the shutdown of the coal-fired plants, Mr. Speaker, the jump-starting of a renewable industry, investments in transmission lines across the province, investments in a system that had been degraded, Mr. Speaker, because of a lack of investment by previous governments, and Mr. Speaker, for months now we have been working to find ways to take costs out of the system, Mr. Speaker. We have renegotiated contracts like the contract with uh, Samsung, Mr. Speaker. We've made decisions not to invest in new nuclear, Mr. Answer. Speaker, which will save billions of dollars to the system. We know that there's more that has to be done, Mr. Speaker. We'll be bringing our plan forward soon. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. The Minister of Energy actually went off his Liberal talking points and said, I quote, this is what the Minister of Energy said, hindsight is 2020 when it comes to Premier Wynne's disastrous energy policies. Mr. Speaker, hindsight is 2020, but hindsight doesn't put money back into the peop in people's pockets. Hindsight doesn't turn the lights on. Hindsight doesn't make it easier for seniors to choose between heating and eating. So, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, the Minister of Energy says hindsight is 2020. Do you agree, Mr. Speaker? Does the Premier agree that her policies has been disastrous, or is just uh, just more talking points? Thank you. This is a very, very important issue. It's an important issue to people and businesses across the province, Mr. Speaker. But I have to say that I think the Leader of the Opposition has embellished what the Minister of Energy said just a bit, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Energy is very supportive of the fact that we're saving $4 billion a year in health care costs because the coal-fired plants are shut down, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Energy and our whole government is very supportive of the fact that we have a reliable clean electricity grid in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. The reality is those were decisions that were made in order to have a clean grid, in order to rebuild an electricity grid that was not reliable. Are there things that we could have done differently? Yes, Mr. Speaker, of course there are. And hindsight is 2020. We've acknowledged that. But the reality is today we know that more costs need to be taken out of the system. Thank People you. need relief, and we're going to deliver that. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. The Minister of Energy's mea culpa was Friday. They've already forgotten it. They've already forgotten they said hindsight is 2020. Well, the Minister of Energy actually said, he said, how did we get here? And I'm going to answer that for the government. The member of Leeds Grenville would be very helpful to the speaker when he's ready to stand up and tell the other side to stop that he do. Please finish your question. Mr. Speaker, this may be a laughy matter for the Liberal benches, but it isn't. Ontarians are struggling. They can't afford their hydro bills. The Minister of Energy said, how did we get here on Friday? Well, let me answer that for him. The Green Energy Act, absurd executive salaries, cancelled gas plants, the fire sale of Hydro One, giving away millions of free electricity to neighbouring states. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is this. If there really was a mea culpa, which one of those policies are you going to walk back? Is it the Question. Green Energy Act? Is it the executive salaries? Is it the fire sale of 
five to one. Which one of Thank your you. policies are you going to walk out? Thank you. <laughs> you see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Well, as I said, Mr. Speaker, this is a very serious issue, and we are taking it extremely seriously. But that's why we have to deal with the facts of the matter. We have to deal with the possible solutions that we are considering, Mr. Speaker. And you know, I've I've said I've said I support what the Minister of Energy said. T hindsight is 2020, Mr. Speaker, and maybe maybe the leader of the opposition would go back to when his power was in office, when his when his party was in office, and look at the decisions that were made during those years, Mr. Speaker. Maybe, maybe he'd look at the sell-off of 407 and the lack of the lack of benefit that came to the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Maybe he would look at the energy policies. But the reality is we're dealing today in the reality that more needs Thank to be you. done to give people relief, and we're going to do that. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Premier, do you believe, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, does the Premier believe this recent mea culpa will bring back the jobs, the investments that have fled Ontario? In every part of this province, we have lost jobs. We have lost investment because of this destructive hydro policies. And I hear the government heckling, no, we haven't lost any jobs. We haven't lost any investment. They are dead wrong. We have lost investment. We have lost jobs. So, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, how are you going to get these jobs back that we've lost? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know um, the uh, the leader of the opposition seems to um, not recognize that. Ontario actually is leading economic growth in the country, Mr. Speaker. We're leading in job creation, Mr. Speaker. We're outpacing the growth of OECD countries, Mr. Speaker. So, in fact, in relative terms, Ontario is doing very well. The, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, that there are there are parts of the province where they're they're not um, sharing in that economic growth as evenly as others, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that. But the net new jobs, the net growth, Mr. Speaker, Ontario is doing very, very well. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. In this bubble of Queen's Park, the Premier may believe that Ontario is creating jobs, but you leave Queen's Park, you hear stories of businesses. It's a very different reality. You know, on the weekend I visited Ross Smybert, who's 89 years old, has run North Star Ice in London since 1954. Member from Economic Development. In less than two years, his hydro bill has gone up $100,000, or 55 per cent. He employs 25 local London residents, but he said it would be cheaper to run his business in Michigan. He has poured his heart into this company for 63 years, and he's struggling to keep it in Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier is, all these jobs you say you're creating, what's your message to Ross Smybert, who's struggling to keep his business in Ontario because of your policies? What is your answer to him? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, whenever there is a job loss in the province, obviously that affects the family, it affects the community, and it's of serious concern, Mr. Speaker. But the reality is that in Ontario, we've created 697,600 new jobs, net new jobs since the recession. 303,000 jobs since I became Premier, Mr. Speaker. 28,000 new jobs just last month. 2,000 2, tech jobs, net new jobs in London, Mr. Speaker. So the reality is there is job creation happening. There are different jobs. I will, I will absolutely acknowledge, Mr. Speaker, that there is a change in our economy. We are going through a transition. That is a reality. But to suggest that there are not jobs being created is just not the fact, Mr. Speaker. There are jobs being created in this province. There are net new jobs, Mr. Speaker, and our unemployment rate has been at uh, below the Canadian average for 22 months. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, the 
government's own cabinet documents say there are fewer jobs today relative to the population than before the recession. That's their documentation. So let me share another story about how this is hurting jobs in Ontario. Master Nardi Produce Limited was awarded the Premier's Agri-Food Innovation Award. But the problem is, because of this government's policies, they had to move that award-winning project they got the Premier's award for to Michigan. In fact, Master Nardi has now invested $100 million since 2011 in Michigan. They're an Ontario family. They want to invest in Ontario, but because of this government's policies, they can't. They tell me they're worried now that all their future investments are going to go to the U.S. Mr. Speaker, why has the Premier created Question. policies that are driving jobs like the Master Nardi ones in southwestern Ontario into the U.S. and not into Ontario? You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you. Premier, economic development and growth. Is facts still matter in this province? They may not matter to the leader of the opposition, but they matter to the people of this province, and they matter to our business community, who have. I can. Mr. Speaker, facts still matter, and the fact is 697,600 net jobs have been created in this province since the global recession—87.8 per cent full-time, 78.6 per cent above the average wage, 75 per cent private sector jobs. Those, Mr. Speaker, are the facts. The Leader of the Opposition can deny them till the cows come home, but he's wrong. We're creating jobs in this province. We're at the lowest level of unemployment in Ontario that we've had in eight years, Mr. Speaker. That being said, our Premier cares about those areas that haven't Answer. kept up. So we're going to keep investing in our regional economic development funds. We're going to keep growing Thank this you. province. We're going to keep Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Families are at a breaking point in this province when it comes to keeping up with their skyrocketing hydro bills. People like Jane in Kingston, who's been forced to choose between groceries or electricity. She bought groceries and her hydro was cut off. It took a political crisis for the Liberals to finally take winter disconnections like Jane's seriously. What is it going to take for the Premier to address the root causes of those disconnections, stop just tinkering with the hydro system, and finally bring hydro Hydro prices under control. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I know that the leader of the third party knows that uh, winter disconnections have been, uh, should in in every part of the province, should not be happening now. And uh, if there is a situ if there is a situation where it's happening, I know the Minister of Energy would want to know about that. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, I have said repeatedly in this House that I understand that uh, there are people across the province who are overburdened by their electricity costs, Mr. Speaker. We have moved to. Uh, reduce their cost by 8 per cent, Mr. Speaker, but we know that there is more to be done, and we will bring, be bringing a plan forward. We're looking at all options, Mr. Speaker, and we will be bringing a plan forward to do just that, to further reduce people's electricity costs across the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, electricity isn't a luxury, and it shouldn't be priced like one. People like Michelle and Smith, though, Speaker, have had hydro bills so high that she's being forced to choose between filling the family's prescriptions or paying to keep the lights on. No mother should have to make that kind of choice, Speaker. The Liberals have had almost 14 years in government. They have put the interests of a small group of their well-connected friends ahead of Ontario families by selling off Hydro One and selling out people like Rochelle in the process. When, when will this Premier wake up and realize that she is hurting Ontario families? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, the decisions that we have made to, uh, to clean up the air by shutting down the coal fired plants, to jumpstart a renewable industry, Mr. Speaker, to rebuild lines that had been neglected by uh, governments of all stripes, Mr. Speaker, investments that had not been made, those were decisions that had the people of Ontario at the heart of them, Mr. Speaker. Kids with asthma, people who needed reliable energy.
energy. Amen. But, Mr. Speaker, we have acknowledged that there was a cost associated with those uh, decisions that is hard for people to bear across the province, Mr. Speaker. Electricity prices have gone up very quickly, and we have moved to reduce costs already. We're looking at all options, Mr. Speaker, to further reduce uh, people's electricity costs. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, I look forward to bringing forward our plan in the very near future. Answer. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, people are trapped in a struggle every month to keep their family above water in this province. People like Jane and Rochelle lie awake at night worried sick about how they're going to pay their hydro bill. The Liberals have spent 14 years driving up hydro costs for families, and Premier Wynne is doing more damage by selling off Hydro One and selling out control over our hydro system. Now that the hydro crisis for families has become a political crisis for the Liberal Party, will the Premier finally admit that her sell-off was a mistake and take some real action to lower people's electricity bills? Mr. Speaker, we have been working to reduce costs in the electricity system for months, Mr. Speaker. We have actually years. We have worked with Samsung to make sure that uh, we renegotiated that contract. We have uh, made sure that we uh, made a decision not to invest in uh, new nuclear, Mr. Speaker, which saves billions of dollars into the future. We've put in place the Ontario Energy Support Program to help people uh, on low income, Mr. Speaker. But we know that there's more to be done. And we're looking at all options. And I really, I really look forward to the response by the, third, the leader of the third party when we bring our plan forward, which will reduce people's electricity costs in the immediate term, Mr. Speaker. I really look forward to her reaction because I think that, uh, Mr. Speaker, she should, she should be very pleased with the response, uh, pleased with the uh, the plan that we're going to bring forward. Thank you. Question, as long as it's stopping the sell-off of Hydro One, Speaker, I'll be very pleased. My next question is and in fact, prices went up 50 percent since this Premier has been in office, Speaker. 50 percent. Families need to see some immediate relief and permanent change on their hydro bills. Rural and Northern Ontario speaker, are paying sky-high electricity bills, usually driven by delivery charges that are much higher than those that urban customers are paying. The Premier has had many chances to fix this unfairness. Instead, she chose to watch rural Ontarians go broke trying to keep up with ever-rising hydro bills, hooking up their house's electricity to generators. Speaker. Will this Premier and her Liberal government immediately get rid of the premium that rural and northern families are paying on their hydro bills? Question. Thank you. you know, I'm, I'm very concerned about the additional burden that uh, people in rural and northern communities uh, carry, Mr. Speaker, because of, uh, of distribution charges. I think that it is a, a huge concern and something that the Minister of Energy is working very hard at addressing. In fact, we have already begun to address that, Mr. Speaker, with an extra 12 percent reduction on top of the 8 percent reduction, but we, we know that still there is more that needs to be done. It's interesting to me, Mr. Speaker, that the leader of the third party in her, uh, in her lead-off uh, to this uh, latest question said that as long as our plan uh, stops the, uh, the privatization, the broadening the ownership of Hydro One, then she'll be supportive. Mr. Speaker, that is the one thing that would not take a penny off people's electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. So the one thing, the one thing that the leader of the third party is interested in is an action that would not reduce people's electricity bills. We're looking for ways to reduce Thank people's you. electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker. It's time for a government that gets what families are dealing with and takes action to make life easier for Ontarians. Mandatory time-of-use pricing may have made sense in theory, Speaker, but it's shown to do nothing more than punish seniors who need to keep the heat on at home during the day. And busy families juggling to work, uh, rather juggling work and their kids after school activities who can't fit all of their chores into off-peak hours. The Premier is punishing parents for cooking at dinner time, Speaker. That is not fair. It's time for people to pay less on their hydro bills. People need relief now, Speaker. Will this Premier immediately end mandatory time of use pricing? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Energy. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to rise and talk about what the ISO, our system operator, has been hard at. Mr. Speaker, is doing exactly that. Mr. Speaker, they're looking at market reform. One of the things that we've been talking about with market reform, Mr. Speaker, is making sure that there are opportunities for choice. And the Ontario Energy Board, Mr. Speaker, is also looking at putting pilot projects in there, Mr. Speaker, to offer different different pricing solutions. We get, Mr. Speaker that these types of fixes would actually benefit many of those families like seniors um, uh, who are living in a bungalow, for example, Mr. Speaker, in Sudbury, in my riding, on a fixed income. We know that there should be some choice between that, Mr. Speaker, and the single condo dweller that's happening to live in downtown Toronto. We've actually tasked this, and the ISO and the OEB have been hard at this for months, Answer. Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to find ways to actually help all families right across the province. Thank you. Final supplementary. Here's a news flash for the Energy Minister, Speaker, pilot projects do not create systemic change in our electricity system. Lower hydro bills start with more public control of the electricity system. The Premier has been in government for almost 14 years. She has been Premier for over four, and all she has done during that time, Speaker, is make the hydro crisis worse for people with her wrong-headed sell-off of Hydro One. She has ignored regular people on Main Street in favour of well-connected insiders on Bay Street. Why doesn't this Premier understand that when Ontarians pay their hydro bills, they expect to be paying for electricity, Speaker, for electricity, not for someone else's profits, and stop the sell-off of Hydro One. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Speaker, this House well knows that the sale of Hydro One has absolutely nothing to do with rates within the province, Mr. Speaker. There's absolutely nothing to do with that. But what they, they should know, Mr. Speaker, is that time of use is something that is actually saving saving all ratepayers in this province, Mr. Speaker, money. However, what we need to do, Mr. Speaker, is ensure that we find ways and work with our system operator and work with the OEB, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we can create this system to keep our conservation efforts down because conservation, Mr. Speaker, is the cheapest form of electricity. And we on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, recognize that. That's why we brought forward the, uh, the, the plan to work with our ISO and the OEB to look at those time of use options, Mr. Speaker. But we also know that families need that's help that. right now, and that's why we brought forward the 8% rebate. Thank you, Mr. Thank speaker. You. Your question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, on Friday, the Minister of Energy said that hindsight was 2020. According to the Auditor General, experts at the OPA told the government back in 2009, prior to the green energy coming into effect, quote, to use a competitive procurement for large renewable energy projects. But the ministry ignored that advice and they decided to move ahead with the Green Energy Act that we know is a disaster today. So, Speaker, which is it? Did those experts Chief mislead government the Webb. auditor or did the minister not want to admit that the government ignored the experts so he could shirk responsibility for the skyrocketing hydro rates in Ontario? Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Investing in eliminating coal and building transmission, Mr. Speaker, were the absolute right thing to do. Yes. Investing in renewable energy, investing in green energy, Mr. Speaker, was absolutely the right thing we, to do, Mr. Speaker, because, because of our foresight, Mr. Speaker, because of this government's foresight, we now have a clean and reliable system, one that we can depend on, not something that was in tatters when they were in power, Mr. Speaker. But the whole time, I recognize, Mr. Speaker, that we were not perfect every step of the way. And the what was correct, Mr. Speaker, the what, which is green energy, renewable power. But, Mr. Speaker, we did make some mistakes on the how. Fixed contracts and being technically specific in terms of those methods, Mr. Speaker, actually didn't inhibit competitive tension. But, Mr. Speaker, and we're sir. actually making sure that we brought forward fixes to this, Mr. Speaker. We're now seeing competitively competitive tension, lowering rates, and we're also working on other solutions, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, the minister watched as energy prices, electricity prices in this province skyrocketed out of control. We've seen school boards and hospitals with increases to their electricity yes. bills of 35 percent in one year. 
Just two weeks ago, the leader of the official opposition and I went to Sault Ste. Marie to the FJ Davy Home for the Aged, where the price in one year at that senior's long-term care home went up 39 per cent. It's all on the backs of this Liberal government, and they ignored the advice of the energy experts to go down this hole. Speaker, every time a member of the government takes a question on their electricity crisis, they say they only had two options. Either they could do nothing, or they did the most expensive thing possible. Why does the government think that doing their job right in the first place wasn't an option in the case of electricity in Ontario? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, there was only one option, which was to rebuild a system that they left in tatters that was blacking out on a constant basis. Making sure that businesses actually keep the lights on was our option, Mr. Speaker. Making sure that hospitals were able to do the surgeries that they needed was our option, Mr. Speaker. When you actually de-invest in a system and run Niagara Falls dry is what they did, Mr. Speaker, if they, with the amount of generation they never— Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to find ways to help families right across the province, Mr. Speaker. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? When it comes to renewable energy, we will make sure. Just when I thought I had control, the member from Lanark Front, McLennox, and Addington will come to order. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to find ways to have competitive tension when we're looking at lowering rates for all families when it comes to renewables. The cost of solar and wind, Mr. Answer. Speaker, is the lowest it's ever been in this province, and actually provinces and states are looking to us for the leadership that we've provided on building a clean, reliable system. New question. A member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. New Democrats know that privatization of hydro by the Liberals has hurt Ontario families and businesses. But we haven't forgotten, and neither have Ontarians, that it was the Conservative privatization of Ontario Hydro that helped get us into this mess in the first place. It's time to stop the damage that the Liberals and Conservatives have done to our hydro system and take immediate steps to regain control over hydro costs. Can the Premier tell us? After 14 years in government, when will she finally take action to deal with the hydro crisis that her Liberal government has helped create? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've been taking actions since 2003, rebuilding this, this system, Mr. Speaker. We've made sure that we've invested in renewable energy, Mr. Speaker. We've invested in making sure that we have a reliable system, a clean system, Mr. Speaker. One, uh, one that I know the, the Minister of Health is very proud of as well, Mr. Speaker. We have a system that is seeing reductions in our air pollution deaths being reduced by 23 per cent, Mr. Speaker. Air pollution hospitalizations being reduced by 41 per cent. We all know, Mr. Speaker, that this investment in, in, in building our system, in eliminating coal, and making sure our system is clean and green came with a cost, Mr. Speaker. And with that, Mr. Speaker, we've worked hard. We are continuing to work hard on finding further reductions for families. 8% was on the uh, off of their bills come Answer. January 1st. 12% plus that 8% for those in the Hydro 1R2 areas, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue Thank to you. find ways to help. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier has never taken the hydro crisis seriously until it became a political crisis for her party. And as for the Conservatives, they're offering no real solutions. After 17 years as a Conservative politician, people have no idea where Mr. Brown stands or what he's proposing to do. The NDP knows that people, people have to be at the centre of hydro policy, and the time for action is now. If the Premier thinks so too, will she immediately halt the further sell-off of Hydro One and come up with a real strategy to address the hydro crisis? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, there is no 
cost increases related to the sale of Hydro One. We all know that, Mr. Speaker, within this House. The Ontario Energy Board is the agency that is quasi-judicial that actually sets the rates. But when it comes to the Premier and this government actually taking it to the next level and finding ways of reducing costs for people right across the province, Mr. Speaker, we saved $3.7 billion by renegotiating the Samsung Agreement. We saved $1.9 billion by reducing the fit prices, Mr. Speaker. We've created the uh, competitive LRP process, which saved $1.5 billion. We suspended the LRP2 process, Mr. Speaker, which saved $3.8 billion. We also, Mr. Speaker, um, got new dispatching Answer. rules for wind, saves $200 million. We're going to continue to find ways to help uh, families right across this Thank province, you. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Support. As we all know, 2017 is an exciting and festive year where Ontarians will have the opportunity to come together and celebrate the 150th anniversary of our incredible province. This year, our government's goal is to celebrate the culture of inclusion, innovation and opportunity that uniquely defines Ontario through the Ontario 150 program. Last week, the minister was in Mississauga to announce support through the partnership program for Monster RT Creative Community to provide South Asian youth artists with vital business skills, media training, and a sport network of senior artists and music industry experts. Mr. Speaker, my question to the minister is, can she tell the members of this house about the three Ontario 150 Thank grant you. programs that will promote community- Thank you. Minister of Culture, Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Mississauga Brampton South for the question. Speaker, I'm just thrilled about the energy that we saw in Mississauga at last week's announcement. Absolutely incredible, and the room was just on fire. It was wonderful. Speaker, we're delivering 87 projects through the Ontario 150 Partnership Program to support communities and organizations across Ontario, and we're also inspiring our youth, which I know every member of this House cares about. The province-wide community grant programs that we're rolling out include a $25 million community capital program that supports the repair, renovation, or retrofitting of existing infrastructure to better address the diverse needs of Ontario communities. A $5 million partnership program that empowers our youth, and a $7 million community celebration program, which will ensure the celebratory environment of Ontario 150, reaching Ontarians in every community across Ontario. Altogether, we are funding over 650 events, initiatives, and infrastructure projects across our province to commemorate this historic milestone year. I look forward to the supplementary to provide more information. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I agree with the Minister's comments about the success of the event last week. As this past Friday, I was in my community office, I received several calls from the young artists to in further inquire about the program. And I look forward to celebrate Ontario 150 in my great community of Missaga, Brampton South. Ontario 150 will boost community pride and build a deeper connection to the place we call home. It's a year-long celebration of the qualities and values that defines us as Ontarians. The minister has also announced that there will be additional initiatives across in the year ahead. Can the minister please inform my community as well as the members of this house about what we can expect in the coming year? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. On January 24th, I had the pleasure of watching Ginger Ale and the Mono Whales perform a refreshed version of Ontario's unofficial anthem, A Place to Stand, at Young Dundas Square in Toronto. This important song will serve as a soundtrack in events and festivals across Ontario this year. It stays true to the original A Place to Stand, created for Expo 67, with a modern and vibrant energy making it relevant to a new generation. In addition, we recently created and presented the Ontario 150 television ad to let people know that we're celebrating our province's qualities and values this year. And, Speaker, from the feedback we've received from this ad, it is clearly touching Ontarians. Touching. We're also investing in a number of high-profile signature initiatives and projects, such as the Invictus Games, Ontario Tour, a touring Ontario 150 themed music showcase, and National Canadian Film Day in April, the largest one-day film festival in history. 
Our 150th Answer. anniversary is a chance for us all to celebrate, and I know all members in this House will join me in, in celebrating our communities, our province, and our country in this important year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Leeds, Grenville. Uh, thanks, Speaker. Uh, my question to the Premier. Regardless of any deals made in the back room, it's time this government takes a U-turn yet again on its $14,000 luxury electric car rebate. Mm -hmm. Speaker, will the Premier put the car in reverse and cancel this rebate? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Transportation. Sir, Transportation. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. As I mentioned in the House uh, last week when the same member asked this question, uh, we know, and I think the members opposite know, back in 2010, our government initially launched our very first electric vehicle incentive program, Speaker. Uh, we know uh, that over the last number of years, it was a program that was successful, uh, but a number of months ago, we decided to undertake a modernization of this program to take a look at some of the new technologies that exist out there, Speaker. What we're witnessing literally on a month-by-month -month basis is that more auto manufacturers are putting more options into the marketplace, place, providing more vehicles. We wanted a program that was modernized that could actually take advantage, for example, vehicles like the Chrysler Pacifica that didn't exist, built in Windsor that didn't exist when the program was first created, Speaker, that now exists today. So we wanted to take advantage of all of the new Thanks, options sir. that are there for consumers by modernizing the program. Happy to provide initial, an additional update in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thanks, Speaker. I'd love to go back to the Premier for an answer. Even the Toronto Star editorial board is questioning this government on their $14,000 luxury car rebate. As the Star sees it, and I'll quote their editorial, the fact is the wealthy should not be turning to government coffers to subsidize their purchases of luxury vehicles. Mm -hmm. Or as I like to put it, Speaker, they're robbing Peter to pay for Paul. Tesla. Mr. Speaker, a, a former Premier once said you can never, it's never too late to do the right thing. So I'm going to ask the Premier again, will the government put the brakes on this $14,000 luxury car rebate? Excellent. You know, uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I said this, uh, I was getting at an answer in my, uh, in my first uh, response to the initial question, Speaker. There are literally there are literally more and more products coming out into the market every single month. I'm not sure if the member who's asking the question is aware of the fact that today no, there are somewhere in the neighborhood of two dozen vehicles that are eligible to receive the, the uh, support from our incentive program, speaking, wow. Speaker, right across, literally right across the spectrum in terms of all of the price points that are available, including many options that are available today, Speaker, which our modernized program took into account when we did the update a number, a number of months ago, that do literally provide more options for middle-class families right across the province of Ontario. Ontario. I would encourage that member, Speaker, to take a look at the products that are now available across the entire spectrum of all prices, many of which support people in those middle-class families that he purports to want to support, uh, Speaker. This Thanks, government, sir. this is, for Premier, are supporting those families and will continue to do so. Thanks very much. New question, the member from Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, last week I had a chance to sit down with the Chamber of Commerce in Niagara Falls. One of the main issues on the agenda was hydro rates. These small business owners in Niagara Falls are saying they're struggling to pay their bills. In some cases, in some cases, they're saying these rates are going to drive them out of business. It's jeopardizing jobs in my riding of Niagara Falls. Premier, what do you say to these businesses' owners that don't know if they can keep their businesses afloat with rates like these? And at the end of the day, jeopardizing jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. Mr. Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member for the question. Um, small businesses, of course, are, are a very important uh, part of, of our overall uh, uh, economy, Mr. Speaker, and we recognize the importance that they play. And, and that's why, when we brought forward the 8% reduction back uh, in the uh, fall economic statement, Mr. Speaker, small businesses actually qualify for that 8% reduction that they started getting off of their bills, Mr. Speaker, as of January 1st. One of the things that I do know, Mr. Speaker, is that we're going to continue to find ways to reduce electricity bills for small and medium-sized businesses right across the province and all ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. But there are also many incentives um, for small businesses to actually talk with their local utility, Mr. Speaker, talk with them about the Save on Energy program, in which they can actually save significant money off their bills, Mr. Speaker. We were in um, Niagara Falls 
back in the fall, talking about one of the local industries there that actually utilize yes, many sir. of these programs and are saving hundreds of thousands of dollars, Mr. Speaker. I encourage all small businesses to talk Thank to the you. local utility to make those savings. Supplementary. My question is back to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, it's the Chamber of Commerce that is talking to us and saying they're going to have to close their businesses. And the 8% that you talk about was put on by the Liberal Party. It's nice that you're taking it off, but the reality is you put it on in the first place. Every day, residents in my riding get up and drive right past Niagara Falls. In case you forgot, Niagara Falls is a landmark that drove public power in Ontario for over 100 years. That same 100 years, those hydro prices were affordable in the province of Ontario. Premier, how can you explain these rates to the residents of Niagara Falls who see Niagara Falls every day and also see hydro bills with some of the highest rates in North America? Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we shut down coal plants. We rebuilt the system. Um, we made sure that our system is reliable so that when we had the blackout in 2003, places like Niagara Falls will actually still have their lights on, Mr. Speaker. So what's what we've done, Mr. Speaker, is we've made sure that we have a clean system, a reliable system, and one that people can actually use, Mr. Speaker. We know that we need to do more. We're acting on that, Mr. Speaker. We're going to be coming forward with a new rate mitigation plan in the very near future. But we also have, Mr. Speaker, the Save on Energy program that we encourage all of our small businesses to use, Mr. Speaker. There are many, many programs that are out there that are helping. For example, Hematite Manufacturing in Brantford, yeah. Mr. Speaker, they've actually saved significantly $200,000 wow. wow. every year yeah, on their sir. new equipment, Mr. Speaker. It's great to see that they took advantage of this program. We encourage all small businesses to do so. Thank you. New question, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Mr. Speaker, there are more than 2,200 municipal leaders from across Ontario in Toronto today for the Ontario Good Roads Association Conference, or OGRA. It's one of the oldest, situations, uh, oldest associations in Ontario. This year, we celebrated Ontario 150, and OGRA is not too far behind, and I believe that this is their 123rd year. OGRA advocates for the transportation and public work interests of municipalities, and they represent cities, towns, big and small, north and south, east and west across this province. You could say that they paved the way for many municipal, provincial conversations about critical infrastructure. Last June, members of OGRA assembled in my riding of Kingston and the Islands to meet with city officials, tour City Hall and the surrounding area. I was pleased that we were able to host an important meeting in Kingston. I understand that the minister spoke at the conference this morning. Can the minister elaborate on our government's participation in the OGRA conference? Mr. Minister, Speaker, thank you very much. Um, thank the member for the question. As she mentioned, Speaker, I did have an opportunity this morning to uh, speak down at the OGRA conference and spoke to them as well, uh, Speaker, while we were there about the work that our government has been doing to reset the relationship that exists between our government and the municipal sector. Speaker, we remember uh, before coming into government in 03, there was a period of acrimony, I would say, in the province. It was a time of forced downloading of costs into the municipal residential tax base. It was a time of forced amalgamations. So we spoke at length, Speaker, when I was there in my remarks, and we'll have an opportunity to speak later in the day about the work that we're doing as a government to reset that relationship with the municipal sector. We respect them. We've demonstrated that in a variety of ways, especially I would say one, the AMO MOU table speaker. We meet at least every two months, sometimes every month, rolling through them legislation Answer. before it gets to the stage where it's been baked, looking for their input. I think they very much value the relationship that is now stands. And in the supplementary, I'll have more to add. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for his answer. The minister and many members here started politics at the municipal level, and I have to give a shout out to Mayor Dennis Doyle of Frontenac Islands, who's been a great advocate. And we all know, yes, he is, the role local governments play in Ontario's communities and our day-to-day -day lives. They provide many frontline services like libraries, waste collection, and rec centers. And they help provide co critical infrastructure like the roads we drive on, the parks we walk in, and the pipes and treatment facilities that bring clean water to our taps. Our government is making the largest infrastructure investment in schools, hospitals, public transit, roads, and bridges in the province's history. 
We're investing in the people and communities that make Ontario strong. Infrastructure will also be the key theme at this year's Ogre Conference. Would the minister elaborate on how Ontario's infrastructure investments will support municipalities and local communities all across Thank you. Ontario? Mr. Speaker, again, I thank the member for the question. Part of what I talked about this morning at the conference, people, uh, Speaker, was how we're resetting the municipal fiscal sustainability relationship. Since 2003, the total supports to municipalities were about $1.1 billion. Speaker, today, under our government, total supports are in the range of $4 billion. Wow. That's an average increase for municipalities across the province of 264 per cent. As well, we wow. talked about OSIF. They will know that the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund is being increased from $100 million to $300 million. Yeah. Speaker, that's going to be Great. predictable, guaranteed, bankable money that all of our municipalities across the province can count on every year. I also talked about the gas tax, Speaker, how we're doubling gas tax. Uh, by the year, I think, 2019, we're starting fully phased in by about 2022. For example, Speaker, for the City of Toronto, currently receiving $170 million in gas tax, yes, that sir. will double to $340 million every single Single year, the city of Toronto has already received 1.9 billion in gas tax under our government. Wow. Thank you very much, Speaker. A new question, the member from Dufferin Caledon. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. I've been working with Rose, a mother <coughs> whose son Ricardo has severe developmental disabilities. On Friday, Rose was told she must pick up Ricardo from the hospital or consider him abandoned. Rose needs her son to be in a group home because he and his family are not safe in their home. With no group home spaces available, Rose is considering surrendering care of her son to get him the, the residential space he needs. How can this be happening in Ontario in 2017? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, to the member opposite for her question. Uh, because, uh, of course, we do understand that quite often situations where families, caregivers are looking after those with uh, developmental disabilities do face a number of challenges. And I'd certainly uh, like to hear a little bit more about this particular situation from the member from Dufferin Caledon. What we are doing is transforming the system here in Ontario. And we have uh, committed, as we did to the Ombudsman, to ensure that crisis situations uh, do not occur. So we are trying to work very, very hard with our developmental service organizations to ensure that before a situation becomes a crisis, that we work with families and with caregivers to provide the very best Answer. solution. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Supplementary. While you're transforming the system, you're giving away $14,000 to people who purchase a Tesla and individuals, families, are having to abandon their children. In October, media reports said that a young adult was ab abandoned in Oakville. In the region of Peel, I know of nine abandonments and seven threatened abandonments of children and adults with developmental disabilities in the last two years alone. Abandonment is the last option for families who've been looking for help from your government. It's your government that is abandoning these families. After the Select Committee report in 2014, after the Ombudsman's report last year, why is this still happening? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, in fact, uh, our government does spend some $2 billion on developmental services here in Ontario. I certainly don't remember hearing from either of the two opposition parties uh, in their platforms in the last election about any increase in services for this very vulnerable population, whereas we have made uh, an absolutely unprecedented investment since 2014, $810 million over three years, and we are making really meaningful progress. We have eliminated the 2014 uh, passport wait list one year ahead of schedule. We have provided direct funding for an additional 13,000 adults with developmental disabilities, and this has brought the total number of individuals served by passport Answer. to approximately 24,000. This is a program that our government introduced in 2005. It's providing real help for families, and uh, we, of course, will continue to work to ensure everyone is taken care of. Your question, the member from Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour la Première Ministre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for Premier, the Premier. My constituents, her initial R, AL, is very concerned about her hydro bill. She and her husband are retired senior, seniors on pension. 
they were paying $140 a month for hydro on equal billing. Last spring, in order to save more energy, they spent over $400 and switched all of their lights to LED. But instead of seeing their hydro bill go down, their bill actually went up to $200 a month on equal billing. Premier, how is it that these seniors, who have worked so hard to use less energy, are now paying more for their hydro bill? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. It is important to recognize that, Mr. Speaker, we are working hard right now to ensure that those individuals, like the honourable member has mentioned, are finding ways to see their bills reduced. Mr. Speaker, we are encouraging conservation because conservation, Mr. Speaker, in saves the entire system. Mr. Speaker, when we have people saving, conserving energy, Mr. Speaker, we don't need to build new generation. When we don't have to build new generation, Mr. Speaker, we can actually have cost savings for everyone, and that's something that we encourage, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to individual cases and reasons for individual bills, Mr. Speaker, I'm more than happy to work with the honourable member to find out um, ways that we can continue to help this family. There are many programs uh, that are in place that actually help seniors, Mr. Speaker. The Ontario Electricity Support Program is one of those programs, Mr. Speaker, in which seniors actually Answer. can see their bills reduced significantly, Answer. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I can guarantee you that if there was a program out there to help them, we would have helped them. We do this inside and out every single day in my office. The seniors do their laundry at night. They change all of their lights to LED, and for all of their efforts, their hydro bill has gone up. They are on fixed income and are finding it harder and harder to get by. They are frustrated, they are angry, and they have no confidence that the present government will ever make their lives better. The Premier said that the sell-off of Hydro One would not increase hydro costs, but this is exactly what's happening to each and every one of us in Nickel Belt. When, Premier, will you end the higher cost of rural delivery and give Mrs. A.L. and her husband some relief? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As of January 1st, those customers with Hydro One on R2, Mr. Speaker, have seen their bills drop by $60, Mr. Speaker. We actually enhanced that by $45 to bring it up to $60, Mr. Speaker. But we recognize, Mr. Speaker, that there's more to do, especially for those folks that are in northern or rural parts of our province, Mr. Speaker. So we're actively working right now, Mr. Speaker, to find ways to ensure that we can address that issue, Mr. Speaker, because we do want to make sure that electricity bills right across the province, specifically distribution, Mr. Speaker, is more equitable for where those people choose to live. At the end of this, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to invest in a system that is clean, Mr. Speaker, that is reliable, the one that is benefiting the families like the honourable member is mentioning, Mr. Speaker. We'll make sure that we can continue to have this clean, green system and find ways to yes, help, sir. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question? The member from Beaches, East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Speaker, last year we passed a very important piece of legislation that helps Ontarians who work in the services industry, such as restaurants, nail salons, hair salons, and many other jobs such as that. And through my private member's bill, the Protecting Employees Tips Act, we made sure that the money that these workers earn fair and square was given to them and not skimmed off by the owners of those establishments. Now, my constituents and my people across the province work very hard for their money, and we're happy this legislation passed unanimously in this House. I've seen some advertisements of late in the legislation on the subways and buses across the province, and I know that many people in my riding of Beaches East York have seen these advertisements as well. So, Speaker, can the Minister explain to this House and tell the House what else the Ministry of Labour is doing to promote this legislation and to ensure that employers and employees know Thank you. their role. Minister in of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Beaches East York for all the hard work that he put into this private yeah. member's bill because it is paying off. He talked about the ad campaign, Speaker, and the ad campaign that the uh, member spoke about for TIPS legislation is a great example of how we're making sure, by any means possible, Speaker, that people in this province who work understand the rights they have. Through these uh, ads, employees have the information they need to ask questions if they feel like their employers aren't playing by the rules. But, Speaker, we need to work with the employers as well. So we give them the information they need. 
on our website. We've got information available in a number of languages. Speaker, we've got an interactive video. We've got a question and answer uh, section. But, Speaker, this may surprise people, but Stats Canada tell us that there's 65,300 people that rely yes, on food and beverage services for their employment and re receive tips and gratuities. This is impacting on a number thank of you. people. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the minister for his answer, his incredibly hard work and his support in getting this important piece of legislation through the House. Now, Speaker, People come through my office weekly. They're sharing stories of how they work multiple jobs, they have problems getting paid at times by their employer, or they're just not being notified in advance when they're going to be scheduled for their work, their work shifts. Speaker, these are problems that all Ontarians face, not just those in my writing. And these are some of the most vulnerable people in our society, and all they want is to be treated fairly and to feel like the law is there to protect them. I know our government speaker has taken steps towards helping these people, and this is something of which I am incredibly proud. But that doesn't change the fact that people are still feeling that they aren't being treated fairly across all industrial and commercial sectors. So, Speaker, will the minister please share with this House what our government is Question? doing for these vulnerable workers in our society? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, my thanks again to the member for that very important question. And I appreciate all the concerns that he's just shared with us. I know they're not just felt in his writing, Speaker. These are concerns that are reflected right around the province. Our focus through the Changing Workplaces Review, Speaker, has been to make sure we can help protect vulnerable workers in this province, but while all, all the while, Speaker, creating a level playing field for the vast majority of employers in this province that play by the rules. Speaker, we should be proud that so many people choose to live, to invest, and to work in this great province, but we want to make sure that as the nature of that work changes, Speaker, that the laws are up to date and they reflect the protection and they reflect the preparation that businesses need to ensure they're playing by the rules. Speaker, in the coming weeks, I expect to have a final report on my desk from the special advisors. I look forward to introducing it in the House. Thank you. Good question. Member from Wellington, Holton Hills. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. On February 17, 2016, more than a year ago, the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change suggested in this House that the Ontario Tire Stewardship Program would be eliminated within a year. A year has now come and gone. But last week, in direct contradiction of that statement, he said it would take until December 31st, 2018, the end of next year, to wind up the Ontario Tire Stewardship. How can the people of Ontario trust this latest timeline? Will the minister commit today to winding up Ontario Tire Stewardship immediately? And where's the money going? Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Mr. Speaker, we're actually doing exactly what we said on the timetable we said we would do it on. The announcement, the letter and direction went out to the Ontario Tire, tire Stewardship to wrap up their operations. There are issues and outstanding investigations, which the member is, I know, aware of, that also have to proceed separately and apart from that. And we are winding up the other ones. Mr. Speaker, a little humility from the member opposite, given that this system that we are cleaning up was the creation of him and his party when he was in government. This was just yet another Tory mess, Mr. Speaker, that Liberals are cleaning up. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Huron Bruce. Thank you, Speaker. How can we trust this minister to get anything right? OTS board members were enjoying stays at the Chateau Laurier, Muskoka boat cruises, and having extravagant dinners, spending up to $600 just on wine. On top of that, under this minister's nose, half a million dollars was allegedly stolen. A constituent of mine, Matt, from Townsend Tires near Walton, recently called me to express his concern about the huge burden of red tape that OTS is putting on his company. He wonders why should he even bother because he just doesn't trust OTS. Speaker, the Premier knows full well that her minister, under the authority of Bill 151, can wind up this cartel immediately. So, Speaker, will the Premier please tell her minister to do the honourable thing and take control of another one of her government's wasteful, Question. ineffective agencies? Here, here. Thank you. you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there's something passing strange 
when it was this Premier who ordered two years ago this minister to start to wrap up uh, those changes. And we passed Bill 151, which was the legislation that got rid of all of this. It was the third attempt by this government uh, to pass a bill to do it, of which the opposition parties blocked, in a minority government, the last two two attempts, Bill 93 and that. You blocked it. You also never asked a question while we were cleaning this up. You never asked a question until after we brought forward legislation to wind these up. You weren't even doing your job. And, Mr. Speaker, these were your creations. You thought the private sector could run it all on its own. You created these agencies Thank with you. the problem in it. Our Premier wanted to Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, this morning you have heard the voices of Ontarians from across the province and the impact, the negative impact of Ontario hydro costs are having on them. A few weeks ago, while knocking on doors in Kitchener, Waterloo, I met Liz and Kenneth Costello, who told me that they cannot get relief from their rising hydro bills. Not long ago, Kenneth was diagnosed with a chronic lung disease. His wife, Liz, quit her job to become his primary caregiver. Kenneth now has to be on oxygen machines 24 hours a day. It is not optional. Their hydro bills have more than doubled since Ken got sick. In January 2014, their bill was $289. In January 2017, their bill was $623. They do not qualify for any of your government's hydro relief programs. Question. They are on one pension. They have no other options. Premier, what is your plan to help Liz and Kenneth Costello? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the honourable member for bringing up that, uh, that uh, family situation because it is one of the situations, Mr. Speaker, that we are acting on right now. And I do recognize that the uh, honourable member talked about the OES, OES, OESP program, the Ontario Electricity Support Program, uh, Mr. Speaker, and that they don't qualify for that program, Mr. Speaker. So we are looking at that program and seeing ways that we can enhance it, Mr. P Mr. Speaker. One of the other things that we, you know they will get right now, Mr. Speaker, is that 8% rebate. So that's that's one of the things that I know that they'll get right now, Mr. Speaker, but we are working actively right now to try and find other ways to bring forward rate mitigation to help not only that family, Mr. Speaker, because there are other families uh, right across this province, Mr. Speaker, that need help. We recognize that, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to make sure that we act on that. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm not sure that the Minister of Energy fully understands the gravity of the situation. Um, their hydro bill was $289 in 2014. Today, it was $623. That is a cost that cannot be absorbed by an elderly couple who are living on one income, a pension income, a fixed income. Uh, and, and as I pointed out, 24 hours a day oxygen is not optional for them to use your peak times. Um, what, what this family should be focused on is keeping Ken healthy and focusing on his health. And instead, their primary concern, their number one point of stress in their lives, is their hydro bill. Premier, I ask Question. you again today, do you have a plan that can help Liz and Kenneth cope with the skyrocketing hydro costs in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2003, that family wouldn't have been able to use their oxygen because the power would have been out on a regular basis, Mr. Speaker. We've made sure that we've invested in a system, Mr. Speaker, that will ensure that there's power there, Mr. Speaker. And we'll make sure, Mr. Speaker, that we will continue to find ways to actually reduce rates. We are working on that, Mr. Speaker. We'll make sure that we can actually have rate mitigation in the very near future. Thank you much, Mr. Speaker. Point of order, the member from uh, uh, Leeds Grenville on uh, point, thanks, of order. Uh, speaker, uh, point of order. Point of order. Over four months ago, I filed um, order paper question 132. It was filed on October 24th. Oh it's God. now the the answer was due on December 8th. So now the answer is over two and a half months late. It's a very important issue uh, in my riding. I asked the Minister of Health what action uh, he his ministry is giving to alleviate the rising costs of mandatory water testing for nonprofits, including okay. community halls, legions, and churches. I'd like him to give me an answer. Thank you. Um, 
The minister, the minister would know that um, Standing Order 99 uh, to file an answer within 24 sitting days, and I would uh, seek uh, the minister's response in uh, how he's going to alleviate this uh, overtime answer to a question. Minister. Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Municipal Affairs on a point of order. Earlier, uh, I believe I mentioned, I just wanted to correct my record earlier, I think I mentioned that by 2019 we would be doubling the provincial gas tax to municipalities. Speaker, of course, I meant to say we would be doubling the provincial gas tax rebate to municipalities mm. by 2019. All members are uh, permitted to correct their own record, and that is a point of order. There are no further. Uh, the, yes, there are. Point of order. The member from from Dundas South, Glen Gary. Thank you, Speaker. I also have a question on the order paper number 124 to the Minister of Consumer and Government Services on the uh, order and legal names uh, on on official documents, and it's uh, it's over the uh, the period. I'd wonder when I could get access. Thank you, Minister of uh, Government Services. Uh, uh, you have an opportunity to respond. I'll be happy to investigate that report back. Thank you. Again, point of order, the member from Halbert, North Lakes Rock. Mr. Speaker, I also have an inquiry of the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care that was uh, submitted October 24th and is now um, over two months, uh, over many months late, actually. And it's about the funding formula for mid-sized hospitals and how that's flawed Thank and you. disadvantaged by mid-sized hospitals. Minister of Health, Standing Order 99. Appreciate the reminder; it'll be addressed. Thank you. There being no further points of order and no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.